John Rush. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur uh, since 2008, and I've been building most of my stuff in Norway, uh, Oslo. But uh, two years ago, I moved to Istanbul, uh, temporary, but I really fell in love with the with the country and with with the city and with with the people here. So I'm staying here since then, and might stay here for a while, maybe for a long while. We moved a lot of our team here, and uh, we're pretty happy here. So. Uh, the reason I want to share uh, my experience is that I've been a part of building quite many startups over the last 15 years. Most of them were B2B, some of them were B2C, and a uh, few of them have failed. A few of them uh, are uh, somewhere in between, but some of them have uh, had quite a good success and are leading within their niche in the world. So I have uh, quite interesting insights to share, and I think I've learned quite quite interesting stuff there. Uh, by 2018, uh, I realized one, one thing that uh, almost in all the startups I work in, we, the main challenge we have, at least uh, at the first year, is to build the software, to build the product. And when I was building my first startup, uh, it felt all natural. So we just uh, went with custom code. We built everything from scratch. And it felt right, uh, but it took a lot of time and effort. But in 2010, developers were not so expensive. So it was not an issue, actually. We had the 12 developers building stuff. It was, it was normal salaries and all fine. But in 2017 or 18 or 15, uh, the salaries skyrocketed. And then it was really expensive. And then what I saw is that uh, in the next startups, like every next startup I would start or join, uh, about half of it or more, uh, there were features that I have built earlier in the previous startups, like a login window, profile page, and uh, search, and a lot of the things. And some projects were so similar that they were almost identical. Uh, and then I realized that uh, we have a serious problem uh, in software development world and in the startup world, uh, which is almost every startup uh, has to do most of the things from scratch, uh, and that's such a big waste of time, and that time could be used to actually uh, do the unique stuff rather than uh, reinvent the wheels. So that's the background um, I have, and uh, I'm a developer myself. Uh, I've been uh, studying computer science uh, and uh, uh, doing programming, but uh, I was very interested in everything else, so I ended up being an uh, entrepreneur, uh, programmer, designer, salesman, marketing person, uh, product guy, basically everything. Uh, and uh, so I have pretty uh, broad uh, experience uh, of what I do within my startups. Yeah, so here is the agenda of uh, this presentation. So I have 14 points, and we will start with with some uh, thoughts I have about future of development. And uh, I will explain a little bit what kind of options uh, you have as a startup founder when you want to build stuff. And I will explain uh, in what case, what tool should you use. And then uh, I will share a little bit of my experience uh, that's aggregated experience from all the startups on why I think startups uh, uh, fail and uh, what lessons I learned and what successful startups did uh, to succeed and what's common across them. Uh, then we had an interesting question from someone before this uh, uh, talk, like, do I need to learn programming? And uh, that's an interesting topic we're gonna cover at the end. And uh, when I finish with this and uh, uh, I answer some of your questions if those appear during the talk. I will show you uh, the demo of our platform and I will show you uh, the example on how you can build stuff uh, there uh, by, uh, by using both no code and code. Yeah, so let's go with that. So the future of development. Uh, we think uh, my team and me personally, and I think a lot of the people in the world now, uh, understand quite well that uh, the future of, the, of development uh, is fragmented. So there's no one thing that works for all. So there are startups, there are enterprises, corporates, and there there's, uh, there's critical business such as banking. There is not critical stuff such as uh, uh, like information websites and things like that. So all of them need different kind of tools and uh, you have to really 
uh, spend time on researching what tool works well for your project because if you don't do it right it's almost like you took a ferrari uh for a road trip in the forest uh, where there are all the stones everywhere so it won't really work well because uh, you need some bigger car there same thing here and now i will show you uh like what options do you have and what options uh and what's going to happen with this in the future so the the most common uh, way of building software for startups still is custom code. It's Python, JavaScript, and uh, frameworks like React, Vue, and uh, Interpreter is uh, C Sharp that's popular, for example. Like this is all uh, in the stays in the category of custom code. And custom code was great uh, back then uh, when the uh, cost of development was low uh, and when when there was no expectation from startups to launch quick. Uh, like uh, in 2005, uh, whoever who thought about building something, they thought, all right, I, I have like two, three years, I will build the stuff and then you know, launch it. So it was uh, quite a different world because uh, most software was built for very serious applications and there was very little software built for, uh, for little problems. And now we're in a world where there are a lot of little problems to be solved and custom code there uh, is almost always an overkill because uh, let's say you want to build Airbnb. And uh, uh, if you look at Airbnb uh, and if you look at their competitor or let's say Uber, there's Uber, there's Lyft, there's B-Taxi, for example, there are three apps. And if you look at the technology, they're, they're pretty much identical. So three teams separately sat down and built identical technology uh, to serve their customers, right? Which is, uh, uh, and all of them use custom code. Uh, and it was uh, not so, it was wise for them because they had access to capital. But if you don't have a million dollar in the bank, like building the same stuff, what they built would, uh, would require you uh, five, six engineers and at least a year of time uh, to build it. So custom code is for complicated projects where you see that the features you have, you can't really uh, find other places. Like you look at other projects and you don't see exactly this stuff, uh, then you go for custom code. But if you build next Uber, next Airbnb, next uh, marketplace or anything what you see around that, that people have, uh, or not completely that, but you can find parts of it everywhere, that means that's a good sign that custom code is not good for you. Uh, so the other option you have uh, besides custom code is low code and low code is basically the idea of low code is that developers uh, can do their job faster. So low code is targeted to developers. So developers can write less code and get the same results. That's the idea of low code. So it's like less code. And uh, sometimes developers have to write 10 to 100 times less code in order to build their stuff. Uh, so this is very good in cases where uh, you're a developer and you know how to code. And then the best advice uh, I would give here is to actually learn low code platforms because uh, you could be more efficient. Like one man, uh, one developer using low code could actually build an entire project that would require a team of people, team of developers using custom code. So uh, there are a lot of low code solutions uh, in the market uh, and uh, all of them have uh, you know, some learning curve. So you have to be ready to learn a new language or new, uh, new stuff, but uh, it's worth it. So you eventually get quite good productivity after it. But it doesn't work for those who don't know how to code because you have to know programming language here. You have to write text, programming text. And then there is third option, which is no code. Uh, that's very good for those who don't know how to program and who have a very, very standard project. For example, if you wanna build uh, uh, a website that has uh, uh, food recipes uh, where you have to pay uh, for subscription every month and you have access to all these recipes, for example, and things like that, this is a perfect example of a project for no code. And there, are, there are may be thousand no code tools in the market. Like the simple ones are those that let you build uh, websites. 
So you, you can build a website uh, on Webflow or on the Unicorn platform or, or Vix. So that's no code. You don't have to code and you get uh, the website as a result. There are builders such as Glide and Adalo. Uh, they let you build mobile apps without coding. And there is Bubble and there, is, uh, there are other tools that let you build uh, web applications without coding. Uh, it's very good for simple stuff, but once your project is uh, medium complexity or high, uh, it's not that simple. Uh, it actually requires a lot of learning and, uh, and when the project grows, it's really hard to maintain. So no code is really good for small projects, medium sized projects, and often uh, you have to be ready to switch to something else, to low code or high code, uh, custom code, uh, somewhere in the future, when you see that things are uh, going into the you know, direction of uh, making it more complicated. So the other option you have is platforms. Like for example, there is, there is Shopify. If you wanna sell something online uh, using Shopify, is a very wise, wise decision because uh, you can just uh, spend a few hours and you will be online selling your uh, products, whatever you wanna sell. Like let's say you, you're producing uh, courses or shoes or whatever. So they work really well for certain uh, niches. Like Shopify is great for e-commerce. And then uh, there is, uh, there is um, uh, you just another uh, mentioned Gumroad. And Gumroad is also kind of a platform because you can build your own website uh, with the content that you, you want to sell. So these things are really good, but they are extremely limited. So you can only do what they provide you with. But very often uh, for a startup that's where uh, there is trying to validate the idea and see if it works or not, uh, the platforms work really well because the learning curve here is close to zero. Like often uh, almost anyone can uh, get up and running on the platforms uh, within a day. Then you have out of the box solutions. So this is very good for those who wanna build complicated stuff, but the complicated stuff uh, lays within existing solutions. For example, you're, uh, you're a large taxi company and you wanna build uh, a taxi app and most likely there is out of the box solution uh, that does exactly what you need, a taxi app that you can white label uh, and it will just work great and it will cost little and you will gear it very quick. So out of the box is good when, when you have no innovation at all. So you just wanna uh, innovate, not on the technology, but you wanna innovate uh, on a business model or, or, or on the marketing effort and things like that. Uh, it, there are a lot of out of the box solutions, uh, almost for all popular cases, like for hotels, for taxi, for marketplaces, for courses, uh, etc. Uh, so probably it's worth exploring uh, if you're uh, uh, having a standard solution, but which is complicated. Yeah, what to choose? Uh, these are the five options you have uh, when you build software and. Uh, uh, I would always recommend to start uh, to try to pick the one that takes least time because uh, in most startups I've seen the time was the critical element. So you have to be able to launch quickly. If you don't launch quickly, then you run out, out of money, uh, you are slow at iteration, so it, everything becomes too difficult. So just uh, see uh, whether you can do it with uh, out of the box or with platforms, if not with no code, if not with low code, if not with custom code. So go up that way. So try to pick the easiest one and go to the more complex uh, ways of building software if you can't use the simple one. Yeah, so why startups fail? And uh, this is very related to the things I just discussed now. Uh, most startups uh, that I've seen failing uh, uh, fall into two categories. So category number one is the startups uh, who have, uh, who are solving the problem that doesn't exist. And it, it feels to them that it exists, but uh, it doesn't. Uh, people don't wanna pay for it or people don't wanna change their habits to actually use your stuff and things like that. 
Uh, and that's very common, and you have to uh, be fine with that because most likely almost anything you come up with uh, will fall into that category. But it doesn't mean that you failed. It just means that you have to talk to people and understand why they don't think this is a problem, why they uh, don't want to use it, and then uh, you will learn, you will adapt, and then maybe you will change your product, and then you will get product market fit. And uh, here we have the second group, which fails because they can't launch. There is like this huge group of startups that never launch. They, they, they built their stuff, they keep building it, and they just end up never launching because they never managed to build it uh, because uh, something happened on the way they run out of money or, uh, or they lost their developers or they lost interest because it took too long time. So for both cases, uh, the solution, which is very obvious, is move faster. So if you move faster, the chance that you won't launch is very low. So you, if you have to spend a year to build your stuff, it's very high chance that within a year something is going to happen and it will fall off, right? So but if you need a week or a month to launch, then most likely you will launch. At the same time, if you launch quickly and if you move faster, uh, that means that you can iterate faster. That means that uh, you will very quickly get to the uh, users and discover that they don't really uh, get excited about it. That will be the first discovery you get. You have to be ready for that. But I have never had any project where we went for the users for the, with the first version and they were excited. But then uh, since you're fast, you're building fast, the tools you use let you build your stuff fast, you can quickly incorporate the feedback from the users uh, and then uh, come up with a new version and come back to them. And you can repeat that multiple times. So one startup would spend 12 months just building the stuff and you would spend 12 months launching every month. And that's a huge difference. So you have probably 12 times more chance to succeed uh, than the other startup. Yeah. And, and how to uh, launch quickly and move fast? Uh, so first, you have to make sure you pick the right tool for your uh, product. That's the key, that's very important. But the second thing, which is uh, as important as the tool, is what features do you have in your MVP? And very often I see founders uh, behaving almost like a, like, a, like a kid who got into the candy store and wants to get all the candies at once and rather than taking few and living and coming for the next later. Uh, so with features, it's often like that, like many founders uh, over-exaggerate the importance of the features. They, let's say they have 40 features and then I ask them, uh, uh, so you have to prioritize what are the five features you can have and where, where are the 35 you can leave out? And they're like, oh no, I have to have all of them. But uh, in real life, uh, you have, little time, little resources, and little focus. Um, and, and also, uh, once you release something, you have to explain that to the users. And all of it gets simpler when your product is simpler. So actually, with MVP features, your goal is to remove everything uh, you can remove, like nearly everything you can remove. So the ideal thing here is that uh, it might not be possible, but you have to try to get one feature left at the end, uh, one key feature that will be enough to uh, try the experience of your MVP. Because if you have just few features, first, you build it faster because you have fewer features. Second, it's easier to explain anyone what your MVP does because it has just few features. You don't have to list 25 things. And the third, it's easier interface, and that's very important. The UX is very important. And if you have uh, seven buttons on the screen or one, uh, it's much easier with one. So people will click the one button. If you have seven, people might just not click any. Uh, that's kind of how our brain works. If you go to the shop and there are like 500 items of, uh, of a toy, you buy nothing. But if there are two toys, you just buy one. So I think uh, the same thing works here really well. So be very, very uh, narrow on your MVP features and better to make a mistake of not having a feature rather than the opposite. Because if you don't have something, 
uh, you will figure that out. Users will tell, well, I like your stuff, but uh, if you had this, I would use it. And that's great. You, you come and bring it. But imagine you have 50 features, and then uh, you have no idea what features users don't care about because you have different users, maybe, uh, and they won't tell you, well, don't, you, I don't need those features. I just need these features. They will say, yeah, it's all good. But uh, in fact, you, you know nothing uh, what actually works or not. So less features. Yeah. Right. Now I will tell a little bit about what my company does and, and, uh, and what we do to solve the problems I described earlier. So our mission with Mars, uh, Mars X is the company, Mars is the, is the platform. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, solve the problem I just described, where, where, where it takes forever to build software, where, where, where founders uh, fall off the path while building a software because it takes too long, or founders never even start building the software because it's too expensive. Uh, and they can't uh, afford it or they can't write, raise money for that. So we want to bring software development uh, from 12 months to one month uh, in average. And that's, that's our goal. And at the same time, uh, we want to do it in a way that we do not, uh, uh, we, we do not uh, kill the innovation. So we, we, we do not target only simple projects. Uh, it's actually the opposite. We want to uh, make it this huge simplification and you know move from 12 months to one month for complex projects as well and for in innovative projects as well as simpler projects so basically for, for for all possible projects and the way we do it the way we do it is through uh combining all the approaches i just mentioned so uh, in the slides earlier i explained that uh you can use no code low code custom code and out of the box solutions that we call actually in our context, we call it micro apps. And what we did in Mars, uh, we realized that uh, why people have to choose, uh, because very often your project uh, has to evolve. Uh, it might start as out of the box, it may move into no code, later it will be no low code, and then it will be custom code. So it while uh, you drive your project and you get more users, you learn more, uh, the requirements change, the complexity is growing, and very often you have to move to the other tool. And uh, in the world we live now, uh, you have to actually uh, throw everything away what you've done with no code and move to low code, and then later throw away everything you've done with, with low code and move to custom code, for example. And that's very sad because you have to start over every time you move from one uh, technique to another, right? And also you have to spend a lot of time picking the right technique from the beginning. Uh, and that's uh, the decision which is very difficult to make and, uh, and you never know where, whether you made it right. So what we did is we made a platform where we let you use all these four techniques on the same project and you can just move from one interface to other interface whenever you need. For example, you can start just with a micro apps. Let's say you're building uh, an Uber app uh, or Airbnb, and then you just get Airbnb micro app, which is identical to Airbnb, and you just change some colors and uh, put you put your own logo and things like that. And that's very simple. You don't need any special knowledge for that. And now you have functional project. But then later you want to add some uh, some little things. So you go into the no code interface. You learn it a little bit. You don't have to know how to code. You just not have to know how to uh, learn stuff. So you change stuff on the, in the no code interface. And at some point you hit the roof with that as well. And then you move to the low code interface. And there you have to either learn uh, some of the coding or you find new team member because you're kind of ahead in your journey. And then a uh, year from now or, or two, uh, things get more complicated and you hire an engineer who switches to the custom code and can add things that, that are not possible to add from no code and low code. And that's very, very uh, good journey for a startup because almost every startup uh, uh, goes through this journey 
if it's successful, it starts with fewer people, uh, simpler tools, and then more complex, and then at some point, uh, a proper team with, with, with many people solving uh, each their problem, right? And we made a platform where uh, it all can live on top of one project, so you don't have to scrap everything you've done, you can just move on with that. Yeah, I will come back to uh, Mars more at the end of the demo. Uh, um, end of this talk, I will show you a demo of uh, how it works. We had a question uh, from the uh, guests. Uh, what lessons I have learned while building startups over the last 15 years? And uh, I think there are a lot of lessons, but I would share uh, just one, uh, one very important lesson. Uh, which is whenever you build something, uh, make sure you build something you care about. Because uh, it's very often people pick ideas based on what's, uh, what's popular. For example, there is uh, Web3 hype, everybody goes and builds Web3 stuff. Then there is uh, social network hype, everybody builds social networks. I think that's uh, that's very very dangerous uh, because uh, building a startup takes a, a long time. Uh, I've spent seven years building my first startup. I was sure it will take a year or two. That's what everybody uh, in the internet was was telling. But in fact, me and all the people around me, uh, all of us have spent about seven years for the first startup to get from zero to. Uh, success and where your startup was uh, redefining the category it is. Uh, and seven years is very long time. And uh, it would be impossible to do some job really hard for seven years where there are a lot of risks, uncertainties, you don't get paid well, uh, and every other month uh, you're uh, on a crisis of uh, going bankrupt and things like that. So it's not uh, a comfortable job, right? And and if you don't like what you're doing, uh, then uh, it'll be difficult to be in that game. And I've seen a lot of uh, competitors I had in those st startups uh, who went out of the business because uh, they didn't, they weren't excited about what they do as much as I did. So you have to be excited about the problem. Uh, you have to be excited about the problem for a while. It's not like you realize the problem today, like, and then you go and uh, fix it. You have to live for a couple of years with that problem, right? Like, like for example, when, when, when we built Mars, I spent 12 years with the problem of complexity of software development. So I just hated this problem. And that was the thing I hated the most in the world is that this, it takes too long to build software. And that's very good uh, problem to solve because uh, I really hate it. I, uh, I, I really hate the problem. And then the other thing uh, which is important is that you have to love your users. You have to love the people uh, who are your target users. For example, if you if you hate uh, uh, or, or or if you have no passion to singers, for example, to the artists, and you're building a startup that targets them, uh, it's real difficult to make it work because uh, whenever you sell it to them, uh, it won't you won't be able to sell uh, because uh, in order to sell, you have to have passion to the problem solution and to the people who are going to use it. So that's, uh, that's the lesson I would share. And it's not the lesson uh, that's popular to share. Like usually people share other things, but uh, for anyone who hasn't started yet or thinking about the different problems and the ideas, uh, think a lot about whether, um, you care enough about that problem and you you love the users enough. Yeah, so what do successful startups have in common? And uh, I think it also grows out from the previous uh, answer. So uh, successful startups care a lot about the problem and love their users, but also uh, they can't ignore the noise. Like I remember uh, when we were building our first startup, uh, there were a lot of cool things happening around. And, and some of my friends and some of the people from my, my network, they couldn't focus on their own startup because uh, they were seeing a lot of temptations 
with other ideas and segments, right? And and I had the same, and uh, and I've I've done some some work on the side. I I went into, into the Web three and crypto world for a while as well, uh, because it was very very tempting. It felt like I'm missing out on those things, but that was uh, I was probably lucky to understand that. Uh, I have to really focus on what I do, and uh, there will be always million things uh, that uh, tempt me to uh, go and do them as well. But uh, you know, you have to focus on long journey. And I said to myself, well, you have to do this for like five, seven years, and just don't think about other things. And everybody who has done that among my network have done well, but everyone who was always uh, juggling between the stuff they ended up uh not succeeding in any of the stuff so that's very very uh simple advice i i'm sure everyone heard that but I, but i would emphasize the importance that from my experience among the 100 people who were around me uh and in the startup i was part of like only those who were very focused for a very long time had success and that might lead to the conclusion that if you are focused for a very long time on a problem that you care about with, with users you love, uh, you will succeed inevitably. So that's that's the guess I have. And so far, I haven't proven that wrong. I haven't seen that being proven wrong. So everyone who was focused for more than five years, they did well. Not all of them made an exit and a, a unicorn, but uh, all of them are uh, have built a serious business that makes revenues and uh, and pays the bills and the growth. Do I need to learn programming to build MVP? Well, I just started that on that with Nader before this talk started, uh, and uh, I think you now we have to define what programming means. So most people think programming is writing code, where the code is the text, right? And uh, uh, what I think programming is, it is a process where you take your ideas and thoughts and things you imagine and turn them into the machine code, right? And right now, to turn your ideas uh, and things you imagine into the machine code, you need a programming language. Then you need a developer who knows that language that can turn one into the other, right? But in fact, that road gets shorter and shorter. Like it gets faster and faster to actually turn ideas into the programming, uh, in, into the machine code. So. I think in the future, that thing will become so hidden that people won't even think about it. But the programming will lift up and become a process of not writing the text code, but actually uh, figuring out what your product does, what are the features, what is the UX, how every flow works. Like let's say you have a user coming to your site, it makes a search, search retrieves the results, results have options to buy the items. So this kind of thinking is the programming because you're programming, you're taking big problem like, and you're the, the, the compiling it into the little sequential actions. And that's programming, right? Um, that's why I think uh, it's impossible to be a founder if you can't, uh, do that right now uh, you have to use help from programmers in order to uh, write the, the the code but tools like ours and all the emerging tools around no code and low code they make it easier and easier to translate your ideas and thoughts and imagination into the machine code sometimes without even writing a line of code so that's why uh, I think uh, the best way to to train your brain to be able to do this process is to actually learn programming. It's not necessarily you'll be programming, 
But when you learn programming, uh, you just become a better founder because you can, you're able to articulate your ideas in an understandable way for those who are going to implement it. And with the tools like Mars and like other low-code and no-code tools, you can actually do it yourself without coding, but you, your brain has to be able to decompile the idea into the sequences, you know, where there are step one, step two, step three. Uh, so that's what I would recommend everyone, like learn basics of programming to improve your ability to do this. But I don't think you have to learn uh, the full real programming because that thing is inevitably going to become a very tiny uh, place where very, very skilled professionals will be writing code. But everything else, what's, what exists in the world already, uh, you don't have to write code for that again. And tools like ours and, and like a lot of other tools uh, are going to remove the need to write code for another search, for another user profile page, for another authentication page. Like those things, you don't have to write code anymore for. Yeah, so that was quite fast. Four minutes, perfect. So we, we agreed that they have four minutes for all this, and I did it right on time. Uh, I will show uh, the demo, very short demo, on uh, on how Mars works. I will just show the no code part of it. Right. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. So. Here's Mars no code, and the, I will not go through all the details. I hope you're just intuitively going to understand what I'm doing. But when I press right click on any of the folders here, I'm able to add micro apps. Uh, so imagine that it's like you're building a house, and uh, there's IKEA where, where there's everything, and you just go to IKEA, you get the kitchen, you get the sofa, you get everything. And you just place it in the right places, and that's it, right? Uh, so you, you you don't have to build your own chair, build your own uh, fridge, and things like that. So that's the idea of Mars. Like in the custom programming, you actually have to build your own chair, your own fridge, your own windows. Like everything has to be built custom all the time. You can use some libraries, but that's in real life. It's very rare when people do that because it's very difficult to uh, com combine a lot of libraries because they're so different. So in Mars, the idea is that uh, you can just combine all the features that exist in the world in one app. Like let, let's say uh, you wanna take a social feed from Facebook, you wanna take user profile from Airbnb, you, you wanna take um, a map from, from Uber and things like that. So you can take features from all the projects. And these features, we call the micro apps. So it's fully functional features. So I will show you an example with a simple one. For example, I wanna make a collection site. I wanna make a website that will uh, display uh, uh, the, this, the events and speakers uh, for, uh, for this uh, Startup Without Borders, let's say. Yeah, so I come here. And I created this uh, new collection, and I just rename it Startups Without Borders. So this is a project, actually. So it's empty so far. Like, there's n n nothing here. But let's, uh, let's define it. So what you see here now, we call it no code. So now you don't, ha you don't have to have any developer uh, knowledge uh, to run it. So it's a, uh, it's a visual... Uh, settings and visual builder. So uh, let's say I want to have co a collection group by categories. I want to have uh, a card with image on the top. I want to have uh, three items per row. So and I, I go put items. Let's say I want to have uh, speakers on top. And I, it will be me, the first speaker. So here I am on the left, right? And then let's have another speaker, hopefully he joins the next year. And then uh, below we wanna have the events and then uh, oh, 
and then you get the feature of that. So this is the example uh, where you can build a website like this, uh, where there are items, you can like these things, there they have views, and, and I can just uh, make categories. Uh, so I could just build uh, the whole conference website uh, this way, or and and I can make people pay for these items, for example. They they can be hidden. So if I press, it asks me, you have to pay. I can make uh, people subscribe for this, uh, where people subscribe and they receive all the, all the updates. So this, this is the example how it works uh, on, on a very simple micro app. So this is just one micro app that's called uh, the collection micro app, right? And I can do the same uh, for uh, other things, for example, I will show you. Uh, so this is uh, the other mi micro app, which is uh, a marketplace micro app. Let's say you want to build, uh, you want to build a marketplace for, uh, for smiles. So you you just order somebody to send you a smile, um, and uh, so you come here and you find uh, a guy who is willing to send you the smile, and then you send the request, and you have the chat. Yeah, so that's how it works. Uh, that's very short, quick demo. I will not bother people more with the uh, with the demo, and uh, but I will just de describe a little bit uh, the idea uh, I've been presenting. So the idea is that uh, uh, we have uh, thousands of micro apps that are built by startups. So there are startups, there are developers who come into our platform, and they say. Uh, we are really good at chats. Like we really know well how to build a chat. And I tell them, all right, so you build a micro for a chat, you make it amazing, you make it as good as Messenger or WhatsApp, and uh, and we will pour it in, into our marketplace. And then whoever other founder who comes and they need a chat in their product, they can just use your chat. They they they, they can put your chat into their product. And, and that's how the whole thing works. So the chat, the search, the user profile, like uh, marketplace, Airbnb clone, Instagram clone, all these things, uh, they get created by third party uh, people who make a living on that. So they're, so it's not created by us because we were not, we will, would never be able to create so many amazing micro apps because it's very complicated. And every micro app has own team that's uh, doing this as their primary startup or project. And, and you basically benefit from this because you just grab the micro apps that have thousands of hours in the micro apps uh, spent by those developers and just get it at once, right? And suddenly have amazing chat because one of the problem when you build things from scratch that everything works bad, like you can't be, build amazing chat uh, in a month, two, or even in a year because it takes a lot of time to build good chat. But, but users are very, very picky and they are very spoiled and they expect everything everywhere to work really good. Right? And then suddenly your chat is not as good as, as WhatsApp chat. Well, they don't like it then, right? Like, but if you look at this from other hand, why would you have to build a chat? Like, let's say you're building a project where there's chat with, within, but why do you have to build it? Like, you, you you do not build your fridge. You just buy the fridge, right? So that's the idea of uh, Mars. So we combine everything what exists in the software development world in one thing, and uh, we create community where uh, the experts create those micro apps and you can benefit from that. Uh, and uh, nothing, we hope that in the world of the future, nothing has to be built again because it's such a waste of time that thousands of teams are sitting right now and building the same chat function probably in, in their systems. Imagine like we free up their time to do stuff what haven't the stuff that hasn't been done before, and suddenly we will increase the the innovation and uh, and creativity like hundred or thousand times. 
that's yeah, awesome, that's, uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, John. I don't know where, where should I start? I have so many comments. I really love your <laughs> presentation. Thank you so much. Um, but just for the record, when are you launching for Mars X? When, when can I finally use it, <laughs> John? Uh, well, w we have been uh, available for, for a long while, uh, but we decided to uh, close the open registration uh, three months ago because we had too many people uh, coming and it was just impossible to handle uh, the onboarding process. So we, we closed it down now and we plan to open it back once we are ready uh, with all the documentation and videos and that will be during the fall, during this fall, the autumn. This fall, that's amazing. And uh, one of the points like uh, you mentioned about why startup failed, it's uh, they cannot launch and yeah i'm, I'm facing this uh, this problem john like i have i have this idea for an amazing event management tool because because i was talking also with anna about this problem anna from uh, mars x like yeah about event management because i'm using tons of tools like from notion to link shortener to linkedin to zoom to all these kind of tools and i was like why there's like one tool that i can save everything so i just started on bubble and then after like two days i was like nah, i completely forgot about it so it's like I, uh, and my question is like with Mars X, for example, like what about the learning curve? If I, if I start like, would it require a lot of learning curve like like the other tools or? Yeah, so uh, that's the problem. Like the learning curve is so high that people uh, don't take a risk of learning anything, right? And and that's why it's because there are a lot of things to learn and you don't even know which one uh, worth learning. Uh, what we did uh, to solve this problem is that uh, we have multiple levels of entry so the the easiest level of entry is where i just presented you where you you can create uh the whole project with one click and it's just there and just specify settings so that's like super simple you don't have to learn anything you just have to intuitively look around the interface and enter the data right uh and, and change settings so there's no programming really you're not building stuff there you're just configuring uh the micro app as a risk and that's the easiest way to enter and if your project uh overlaps completely with what the micro app can offer then there is no learning and that's kind of cool but uh if it doesn't overlap then you you can go into the builder part the builder where you don't need the code and there you have to learn uh the concept of uh, you know what means building in no code similar to Babel, for example. And then you have uh, the next level where you have to write code, but a little bit of code uh, and simple code. So you don't have to learn uh, the whole computer science degree uh, and spend five years. Uh, it's more like you have to spend a couple of weeks uh, or months uh, to learn uh, what programming is. And that was kind of enough to program in our low code environment because uh, it's very, very little subset of what programming can do so that you, uh, you have to know very little to use it and then there is uh, uh, the most complicated part of mars where you have to know coding really well to do things so we have these four gradations and uh, i think uh, i haven't yet seen uh, a case where the incoming project uh, couldn't start with the simplest one well you have to adapt you have to uh, do what that micro, micro app can do, right? Uh, but then uh, why not? Uh, most likely what you want to do uh, doesn't have to be exactly the way you want to have it, right? And the, the price that you pay to have it exactly the way you want uh, is you know, building it from scratch. But here you, you get it almost with no effort. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, uh, we have four ways of uh, using Mars, and uh, it goes from very simple to simple to average to complex. Thank you so much, uh, John. And uh, now we'll open uh, the floor. On the floor, we'll open the Zoom to any questions uh, our audience might have. And Reem actually have a tough one for you, John. How how do you make sure that you have any tips on how to understand the user needs before actually launching and building the, the oh. actual stuff? Yeah, it's that's a good, a good, good question. One. I had this discussion with my friend uh, Vitalik uh, yesterday, and uh, uh, it is difficult. Nobody really knows how to do it well. 
because uh, if you look at the theory, they say uh, do customer development, ask questions, uh, and things like that. But the problem with it is that um, very often users, people, just don't know what they want. And if, if you ask them, they will either be polite and say, yeah, that sounds amazing, I want it, because they don't want to be rude. Or if they're conservative, they will say, no, I'm fine, I don't need that, like, why would you change it? anything. But from my experience, uh, what I did, uh, whenever I launched, uh, I had that uh, problem as well. I, I really wanted to understand if users needed before we were launching. Uh, so I tried to make a story about what I do, not a question, but a story, and tell it to people and see if they're excited. Because if you ask, you get wrong answer because they can't really handle the question. But if you just tell a story and you see people are excited and they start saying uh, some of their ideas about the same thing, then you see that they are also finding that as a problem. Right? For example, let, let's say you're building, uh, your idea is to build uh, uh, a cat uh, sitting, like you know, the, the, the marketplace for cat sitters. And you can go and ask people who have cats whether you would use it or not. Uh, and uh, the value is very little there of their answer uh, because telling I would use it and actually using it never correlates because to use it, you have to change your habits and things like that. But if you uh, talk a lot uh, about the problem that, you know, uh, I always have to sit home and can't go to a conference because the cat doesn't have anybody to be with, I can't take the cat to the conference and just, uh, explain this and make an, an interesting story about this to all the people you see around you. And if you see people starting to complain and actually coming up with the same problem like you, uh, then that's a good sign that the problem exists, right? Because people might be saying, uh, well, you know, here's the solution. Uh, just take your cat with you uh, in the box, right? And then uh, you understand that uh, it's not everyone ha having this problem. Uh, because if you ask directly, hey, do you want to use this kind of service? And they tell you, uh, no, because I have this uh, box. Uh, it's not very, very accurate uh, answer because uh, maybe uh, the person didn't understand your pain and good enough because the question doesn't explain the pain. To explain the pain, you have to tell long story. So that's why I always did. Uh, even with Mars, before I started, uh, I was, uh, this is a really difficult project, so uh, you really have to know that people need it before you start, but I was sure I need it. And the only thing I was doing at all times is, uh, you know, uh, propagating this story about all the problems of the software development and how nobody's solving it and, and how it just gets worse and worse. And almost everyone was saying to me, yeah, that's the problem, it gets worse and worse, and we don't know what to do with that. And, and that was a good sign for me that everybody cares, everybody hates this problem, and then it was easy to start. But if I told them, hey, guys, we have this no code plus high code plus micro apps, would you use it? They would be like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> right? So uh, the, the answer, Rim, is uh, make a good story and keep telling that to everyone, to your friends, family, uh, people you don't know people you meet on the street, like everyone, uh, and you will you will get the feeling whether anyone cares about this uh, or not. And if they care, then do it. Okay, thank you so much, uh, John, and thank you everyone uh, for, uh, for joining in. I hope you had a uh, lot of fun and uh, lots of uh, inspiration. Thank you so much, uh, John, as well. And if you wanna get in touch with John or Mars X, we have shared the links on chat. And uh, yeah, Mars X, they also have a lot of interesting talks actually on LinkedIn. I've, I've been to a couple of one as well. And uh, yeah, um, yeah. Does, any, uh, does, does anyone have anything to share or? I think uh, we have somebody uh, raising a hand. Uh, um, yeah. Let's wait. Yes, yes, yes. I, I have raised my hand, I'm Hussam. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Hussam, go ahead. Yeah, I okay. guess we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, John, for this informative um, yeah, lecture. It's, it's a very wonderful talk. Uh, 
I learned a lot. Actually, I'm coming from the background of uh, consulting. I'm a business consulting, and I'm here attending actually on behalf of my client because uh, I'm uh, helping them to, let's say, to to test and to see how the directions of the software, because they are a software development house. Uh, so basically, you you talked about the low code, the no code, really uh, fantastic uh, talk. But what about the custom uh, code? If we are talking about a house of development and they want, let's say, uh, to focus on the custom code, since uh, according to Gartner uh, 2022 uh, study, uh, they are expecting the expenditure on the software development to, to grow drastically in the coming years. So do you think that focusing on the custom code in a certain niche area or something, it will be a good idea or no? How how do you envision, let's say, the, the future for this kind mm -hmm. of business? Yeah, but that's good questions. So uh, I had my own consultancy firm uh, doing outsourcing uh, 10 years ago. And we did it for uh, for quite a while and did it uh, quite well. So I know a little bit how this world works. And uh, what I think uh, the, the outsourcing agencies and custom development agencies they should understand that uh, that there will be less and less uh, orders to build another Airbnb, another Uber, and there will be more and more orders uh, to build something what hasn't been built before. That means two things. First, uh, the custom code will become more complicated than it was before. Like 90% of the custom code before uh, and now is uh actually simple stuff just redoing something what's done somewhere else and it's easy to do it because you can have an example of other project and just look at it and set right but now i think custom code will uh, mostly uh, attract the, the projects that can't be built otherwise and that's usually complicated projects so if i was running outsourcing firm now that uh, i would focus on difficult problems. I, I would push my name to the world as a company that can solve difficult problems rather than the company that can solve, they can build uh, another Uber, another Airbnb for you. But instead of that saying that we can build uh, you know, machine learning or AI or complicated stuff that uh, there is no other option for. But then, uh, you know, uh, one more thing uh, I see what's happening and what's going to happen with outsourcing uh, world is that um, some of them are experts in some things. For example, we have one company, one outsourcing firm that has done a lot of projects around marketplaces. And what they do now, uh, they actually used our technology to build a micro app for marketplace. And they use that micro app and Mars uh, to build the projects uh, for their new clients. And doing so, uh, they can build faster and they can have more clients and they have they can reduce the price for them. So that's a competitive advantage for them. And they're having a lot of clients coming to them because prior to this, before having micro app on Mars, their, their, their cost, uh, their price quote was about $250,000 uh, for one marketplace project. And, and that's a very small uh, group of clients because not many can pay that. And now, uh, they can actually drop the price to 70000 and suddenly there are a lot more uh, clients that can pay that. But if you look at their margins and profits, they profit more from this uh, uh, micro uh, projects just because they have spent very little developer time to, uh, to build those uh, for every client. So the profits actually grow, revenue drops. But the profits grow, and that's very interesting because uh, profits are quite low in uh, in agencies. But in this case, you can grow it quite high and have competitive advantage. Uh, at the same time, their micro app sits in our marketplace, and other agencies can use it. Let's say there's another agency that gets an coming a project that's also marketplace, uh, and they can use the micro app built by the other agency. That means that that agency can make money on this micro app, even if the client was brought not by them, but by, by the other company. So, and that's good for everyone because uh, you just get 
more profits, more projects done, better quality. So I think that's where things going to head. Like very few outsourcing firms going to focus on very complicated stuff and they will attract all the uh, very, very uh, smart and uh, you know, nerdy developers. But the majority of the outsourcing companies will have to specialize on certain things like on a marketplace business or on a, on Uber like apps or on e-commerce, uh, et cetera. There are like thousands of those niches. And what we are doing in this game is uh, we're helping them uh, to do that specialization so that they, we think they can use our platform to actually build that micro app and specialize on that. But also we help them uh, to make money on this micro app as there is a product not a service because now it's a service for them. They get a client, they get paid, they spend time, that's the money. But if they put their micro app on a marketplace, then it's a product. So they have service plus a product. And I think uh, moving forward, almost all software houses will turn into the product companies rather than service companies. So they will have a product that's a niche piece of code and they will be maintaining that, improving that and people w would be licensing or buying that, and they will be making money uh, on a quantity rather than on a few clients. I think that's amazing. Thank you so much, John. And yeah, did uh, do anyone else have any questions? Yeah, we have one from Adama. And just starting off as a software developer and very interested in building projects. Would you have any suggestions for how to make a solution helping others need now, like you mentioned before? I don't know if I, if Adama, do you, do you want to explain your question, your question more or? Uh... Yeah, it was, it was kind of vague, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I'm just like start. I've been like a month and a half into software development. I, I had no prior experience. Uh, I used to play soccer, but I kind of, went to a different path and I, I started off learning like just simple things within software development and then I got into like discrete mathematics and then like <laughs> all these other all these other theories and stuff but just simply put now I'm just kind of the reason I started software development is because I just felt like I had like a creativity thing within my mind in terms of like how can I problem solve like similar in soccer how could I I don't know, break a line or whatever to make a pass. So that's how I feel with software development. I think with communication, like you explained before, it's about like listening to what people want to want to have be solved now. And I just feel like there's such a struggle with that. I just need like some sort of guidance of like how we take the next steps. So yeah, that's just like my main yeah. question. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's uh. It's interesting to see people uh, moving uh, from one sphere to the other, and that's uh, very, very inspiring to see as well. I think the best way uh, to start doing something where you're a beginner is to join anyone who is farther ahead than you. So when I started uh, startup stuff back in 2007 or eight, quite, quite a while ago, I I knew I didn't know a lot of the things and I had a lot of questions and I had two options. One was to dig into the books and theory and read it and and apply it later. Uh, but the other was to just jump into the actual train that's running that's not run by me, but at least I'm inside there and I see what's happening around and I can learn and I can increase my uh, network and skills, etc. So my recommendation uh, for you, if you're starting off as a software developer, um, to join a startup. To join a startup that's interesting for you. And it doesn't have to be the startup that you want to you know, uh, marry to the end of your life, but uh, just try to be in that world. And then uh, you know, your, your brain will, will slowly uh, adapt and start uh, consuming all the things happening and then the ideas will start coming so it feels like some things don't come and some ideas don't get created in your head but uh, 
it's always like that uh, for a while but then if you now it's almost like with sports if you're trying to do something uh the learning curve some sometimes with certain things you just can't but once you can it's like with swimming like you can't swim uh but once you learn uh, once you can hold yourself for uh, 10 seconds then you get it then you you go and start swimming properly so i i think uh Join the startup, uh, go to the communities and uh, tell your story. People love stories. Uh, just tell your interesting story about your past and future and uh, ask if they need any help. And uh, a lot of startups are looking for people uh, like you, actually, because what I learned myself is that uh, there are no better people for a startup than people who ha who are in intersection of of two worlds because there is like I don't want to offend anyone but but there is nothing worse for a startup than a conservative nerd or uh, like anyone who is really good at something and that that thing is uh, the only thing that consumes their life because then the view is very narrow and the person uh, usually ends up just just using the skill tool set person had from before but in a startup you have to look at everything from new angle and sometimes people who don't know how to do it are better people because they actually uh come up with a fresh solution so that's why it's not difficult to find uh, a job or or to join a, a founder uh if uh, you're having background like you like if you go to the corporate world then it's like uh, they need all the other stuff but the start world uh would be happy to get you. I had a one more question, one more follow up. Um, yeah, I think um, just like as a like honestly, um, like a, what I feel like, especially like starting with software development, because it is kind of an intimidating industry to get into, especially if you don't have like years and years and years of experience with a technical background. I think, um, and I also looked up like that you're mentioning about startups how. Uh, a lot of the startups that now, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they like more season, seasonal and more uh, experienced developers. So that's why I'm like, oh, I kind of have to build up my, like, I guess you're saying the opposite. So it's like, okay, I have a bit more, more hope now. So I just don't know how to apply it to, yeah. you know, to startups as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, you don't have to get into every startup that exists in the world. So you just need one. And uh, you're right. Uh, a, there are a lot of startups that look for uh, experience. But, you know, those startups are uh, the, the big ones. Like, you know, like those that are in use, etc. But the startups who are below the radars, um, there, are, there are hundreds of thousands of them. And I think uh, a lot of them would be happy uh, for people like you and also uh, applying um, it's not like you have to apply for their jobs uh, the best thing to do here is to just enter the community when you enter the community and start hanging out in a places like this for example like, like people have heard what you said and uh, you know some people might just contact you after this if they're if that's possible I don't know if, if people can find each other after this, but uh, coming to events like this and going into the community of uh, founders is a very good idea, and uh, that's how I found almost everyone I work with. Right? Uh, if people send, if somebody sends me uh, job applications, I don't think I would. I never had experience where I hired anyone uh, who sent me a cold uh, email with a job application. But uh, I hired a lot of people, and I got people as a co-founders and as partners who I met in the communities like this, in the events, uh, speeches, conferences. So try to be there more often. Okay, thank you. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Adama. Thank you so much, uh, John. And uh, yeah, I'm afraid that's it for today. Thank you so much, John, once again for. Uh, in and I just want to uh, yeah, thank everyone as well, our dear guests. And just to give you an idea, as startup through our borders, we try to build an eco inclusive and diverse startup ecosystem. 
So make sure uh, to, to follow us on social media, to join in. A lot of awesome events will be coming on as well. If you have any comments or any questions or anything in my feedback, please make contact me or contact our page, contact, get in touch with John as well. And yeah, and so as just, uh, I really love what John said about being focused, about loving what you do, caring about the solution, caring about the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for all the insights. Love it, love it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for inviting me here to speak, and uh, it was very good questions and good, good people here. And uh, just to uh, close up on this, uh, if you are, if you like what we do and you wanna, you know, go with us to this journey, just uh, join our our Discord group. If you go and join our waitlist in MarsX.dev, uh, that will offer you to join our Discord, uh, and uh, we can we can talk there. Amazing. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, you Goodbye. too. Bye. Thank Bye, you. everyone.